name is Bruce Nilsson. Um, I am a longtime friend of Nate's and Phil's, and we've worked together a number of times. Um, I am a project manager for the moment for Solution Stream, but I'm starting a new job on Monday. So I, I'm not even actually a programmer, but um, I, I find a lot of this stuff just so fascinating that I ended up going back to school. I'm currently a student with Georgia Tech for the online Master's of Computer Science program. And uh, my specialization is in machine learning. And this is part of what I learned from my first couple classes. There's two classes in particular that cover this material. Um, the machine learning for trading class uh, is particularly where I got a lot of this from. Um, because of that, I'm not allowed to show actual code because of honor code reasons. So I'm going to explain the algorithm. And if you were trying to do it, I think I explained it well enough you could implement it from the explanation. That's legitimate. But I can't actually like give you code or something like that for it. So um, reinforcement learning, who's, I, let me just get a quick fill for the room. How many of you uh, know, feel like you're proficient or above with uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning? So, okay, so, so actually that's how it normally is when I go to these. Um, I think this is still a new enough area of knowledge that uh, people just haven't really dug into it yet. It's not necessarily that difficult. Um, I mean, it's like everything. It can be difficult but just to get something going. It's not that bad. So based on that, you probably don't have too much knowledge of reinforcement learning then. Is that, that correct? OK. All right, so this, this is going to be a good presentation then, because I do kind of start with the basics. So there are three types of machine learning. OK. I don't know. Maybe there's more than three types. But you typically hear of three types of machine learning. So supervised learning is kind of the most common type of machine learning. And I'll give you an example of that. Then there's unsupervised learning, which isn't talked about quite as much, but you hear about it quite a bit still. Um, and then there's reinforcement learning, which is neither of the other two. It shares some of the qualities of both, but it's not. There's something called semi-supervised learning, which is truly between those, the first two. Reinforcement learning is, in some ways, kind of its own thing. So, so here's an example of supervised learning. So let's say that I am trying to take, you know, this is house sales, and I've got square feet, and I've got bedrooms. Um, should I, maybe I'll use the mouse maybe so it shows up on the recording. So you've got square feet and you've got bedrooms, and you're trying to predict sales price. So right here we have maybe some real life examples of number of square feet and number of bedrooms, and then what the house actually sold for. Now, this is probably not a terribly realistic example because we all know location matters more than square feet and number of bedrooms. But you don't have, you could do this with machine learning and it would still give you some sort of result and it would work sort of. It just wouldn't be as highly accurate as if you could take more features or factors into consideration. So now if you ever take ever took statistics, maybe as part of a computer science program or something like that, they taught you something called linear regression, which is actually a type of machine learning. Um, so you're going to give it these features, square feet and bedrooms, and then you're going to give it what the correct answer is, sales price. And then you're going to come up with some sort of machine learning algorithm. In this case, I'm doing the simplest one, linear regression, which is just something you would learn in statistics. Many of you probably learned this, even if you forgot it since then. Um, and it's going to try to match a line to the data points, and then it's going to make predictions based on that line. Okay. Now, there are many other more sophisticated forms of machine learning that try to map other types of functions to the data points. You know, sometimes a linear function is, you know, in my experiments with this, linear functions often work almost as well as anything. But there are many things out there that aren't linear and you would need a more sophisticated type of machine learning to be able to match the data points with. So now, unsupervised learning, there is no correct answer. You're starting off with a bunch of data, like on the left side here, and you're saying, okay, I'm going to, I want to see what this looks like if I split it into three clusters. Specify the number of clusters in this case, and it comes back and it says, okay, here is three breakdowns or clusters of that data. It just finds it on its own. And then people will use this and they'll say, okay, hey, we can find clusters of certain types of uh, maybe uh, customers. 
that are interested in certain types of things that are similar, and then we can start to make predictions around the, that group of customers. So a lot of times, unsupervised learning is used as a way of creating new features for supervised learning so that they can get a better predictive algorithm. So um, reinforcement learning has some of the characteristics of both, but like I mentioned, it's not really in between the two. It's kind of its own thing. So it has uh, its own characteristics. Exploration, uh, you'll see that in, when I give you an example. Delayed rewards, this turns out to be very important for reinforcement learning. And continuous learning, okay? Supervised learning, you go through a training phase, then you go to a predictive phase. You're not still training when you're in a predictive phase. And, um, truth is, is, in reinforcement learning, that's the way they do it sometimes also. But in theory, they can continue to continuous learn from the data. Um, now, I've been using this image here. Does everybody know, somebody tell me, like, Anything about this? Do you know what this is? Or is this something that's new to you, the idea of AlphaGo? Has anyone heard of AlphaGo? OK, someone who has heard of it, explain quickly what you know about it. Not know. very I much. I reading the article. It was something to do with uh, like some expert in, or pro at some board game and the computer. Yeah. Track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I can't remember which one's Lisa. Oh, here. Here. He is the world champion in Go, okay, the board game Go. You're probably more familiar with chess, right? Who's heard of Gary Kasparov, chess, and Deep Blue's victory over Gary Kasparov? Okay, how, when was that? I can't even remember. It was back in the 90s, wasn't it? <laughs> okay, so um, the way, so the algorithm Deep Blue that beat Gary Kasparov was an artificial intelligence algorithm. Okay, so what it did is it did a, a game search. So it, it searched through the space of possible boards and moves. So you would, it would look at it, the board, and then this is typically the way they do this, and it would say, okay, I'm going to um, say what happens if I make this move, and then it's going to generate what the new board would look like, and then it's going to say, okay, based on that board, how would I expect my opponent to respond to me if they're making the best possible move? Then it would generate a new set of boards, and it would keep doing that for every possible move. Now, if you had enough memory, and it would take more memory than every atom in the universe, but if you had enough memory, you could, in theory, solve all the way to the end of the game and then play a perfect game of chess and it would be impossible for you to lose. Okay? In real life, because you always have to deal with um, finite resources, and because this is, this is a, an exponential growth of memory space as you start to get more and more moves out, you're probably only going to predict five or six or you know, some number of moves ahead, and then you're going to analyze how good the board is because you just can't play to the end of the game. And now, if you want to analyze in chess, how good is the board? Well, how many of you play chess? Or have you played chess with you? Well, give, give me a quick example of how you would analyze the board. Some really common ways of doing it in chess. Uh, that, that'd be good, obviously. Does anybody, yes? Control of center? Control the center. Maybe that'd be a good way of doing it. Does anybody remember when they like you have the number of points that each piece is worth? Okay, so something like that, you would add up the number of, of pieces that you've got based on that move, and you'd say, okay, based on the assumption that my opponent is playing rationally and is playing as, as good as they can, if they're not, it's, that's actually an advantage to you. Um, and the assumption that I'm making the best possible move, I'm going to look ahead five moves, six moves, as many numbers as I'm able to, with whatever time limit I'm, I'm allowed. And I'm going to um, figure out what the best optimal board would be based on whatever my algorithm is. And Deep Blue had a very clever uh, handwritten algorithm that determined what was the best board through that search space. Okay, and that's why it would be considered an, an artificial intelligence algorithm, but not a machine learning algorithm, because it didn't learn anything. So you could have Deep Blue play itself and it would never get better at its own game, right? Because getting better is a matter of having that ability to evaluate the board. At least that's typical. That's the way they did it with AlphaGo. I, there might be other ways to go about it. And it's so it's and since that was a hand-coded, non-AI piece to the algorithm, um, it never got better unless the developers thought of something more clever to put in there and made it better. But it, it didn't learn by playing. Okay. Now, AlphaGo 
still had the search space. Now, the reason why this is so significant, they, they actually predicted accurately how long it would be before computers beat every human chess player. They understood chess well enough and understood its search space well enough. And the idea of an evaluation on the board was a well enough understood thing that they knew it was just a matter of time before there was enough memory to be there, right? So they, I remember when I was a kid, they would talk about someday chess is going to, you know, computers will beat all humans at chess. There won't be any human that can beat a computer. But they always said Go was unbreakable for a computer. And the reason why is because Go is so much more complicated than chess in terms of evaluating the board, okay? You can have a board strength that one move you miss suddenly breaks the whole strength of the board. There is, there is no really strong way to algorithmically evaluate the board. Okay, at least we don't know how to do it. Okay, now when a human expert does it, they use their intuition from having played lots of games. They don't know how they do it either. Okay, in fact what they're doing is they're using machine learning in their heads to, to learn to evaluate the board and they get an answer back by looking at it, by using their intuition. So the question was, could you come up with some algorithm where a computer could do the same thing? Okay, and reinforcement learning was the algorithm that they used to be able to do this. Okay? So what they did is they used a reinforcement algorithm, which is machine learning, so it can learn from playing the game. And that algorithm got to the point where it could evaluate the board so well that it could beat, beat a, a professional Go player, professional level Go, with one look ahead, I would just look one move ahead, and it could beat the vast majority of human players. Only a, a, a master would be able to still beat it. Once they threw in their five or six um, look ahead using an artificial intelligence algorithm on top of the machine learning algorithm, it was game over. There was no way a human could beat it. Actually, I shouldn't say that. Lee Sotil actually beat it one out of five times. So it, it was beatable still, but it was just better player. So. Okay, so why is it that reinforcement lear learning was able to do this when other types of machine learning or artificial intelligence were unable to? Well, that's what I'm going to attempt to explain throughout the, the presentation here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you kind of, unfortunately, there is a lot of math here, but, but don't, be, don't be too put off by that. You're only trying to get the gist of what the point is, okay? So if you don't follow it exactly, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you're able to get the gist of the formulas and get the gist of the theory that I'm explaining to you. That's fairly understandable, okay? So, and then if, if you're interested, um, I do have some blog posts up that try to explain this and then includes a link to this specific presentation. So you can kind of take a look at it and then you can go to my original source, which was Tom Mitchell's machine learning book. You can look, at, look that up also. Okay, so there's something called a Markov decision process. Mathematicians are not really maybe that different than programmers. Um, good reason for that. They're trying to formalize everything. They're trying to put everything into something that, in a theory, you could feed into a computer and get a result out of. You think about all certain sorts of types of explanations or theories that we have that we don't really understand well enough to put into a computer at this point, to write an algorithm on it. I would argue that even some of our best theories that you hear the most about, like, say, organic evolution or something like that, uh, Darwin's theory. We don't really understand it that well. Certainly not well enough to put it into a computer. We do have things like that we call genetic programming or genetic algorithms. They can't do what like, organic evolution can do precisely because we don't know how to duplicate organic evolution. We don't understand it that deeply yet. So to be able to put something into a computer is the ultimate goal. That would mean where we really understand it because now we can simulate it. So Markov decision process is important to understand, to understand how this works. It's actually fairly simple. It just looks complicated. So what we have is uh, in good mathematical style. We're going to declare our terms. We have S is the states the agent can be in. Okay, so some set of states, whatever that is. Um, A is the actions the agent can take. Okay, so that may be different for each state, but for the sake of argument, we're going to say in every state, they have the same set of actions that they can take. Okay. So that at time t, so think of t, t as being what turn you're on, maybe. Okay. Um, the agent senses a current state. Okay. So state changes over time. So state t means the state at that turn. Okay. 
um, an agent takes action t, so it takes multiple actions. So the action he takes at turn t is declared as a t, sub t. The environment gives reward t in response and moves the agent to state t plus 1. So it moves it to the next state. That's all that's really saying. Okay, so then we have this one is, it gets a little nerve wracking because we're using Greek letters. This is just a function. You could have named it anything. Okay, that mathematicians just like Greek, Greek letters for functions. So we have a function which is the state transition function. So imagine a function that takes state at time t and, a, and the action you took at time t and it returns the next state that you now are in. Okay, so a simple example of that might be that we've got a robot in a maze and it moves north. So it was in one location and its new state is in the next location north of it. Okay, in fact, we'll reuse that uh, example as we go through this. It then receive, maybe receives, the reward might be zero, but it receives a reward for that action at that time. It gets a reward. Okay. Um, the reason why rewards become important is because we want there to be some sort of goal that we're, we're going after, and the rewards would be set up to try to encourage the algorithm to find the right reward. It's also important because rewards happen in real life. Even if you don't understand the reward function, rewards just happen. You know, if, I, if I play the, the stock market, I don't know what the transition function and reward function is. But I know when I receive a reward of earning money, or a negative reward of losing money. All right, so now based on this kind of setup for the Markov decision process, we've got a key assumption, and uh, that the, those two functions depend only on the current state in action. Okay, so it doesn't recur count on anything from the history. That makes sense. I'm only feeding in the current state and the current action. I'm not feeding anything else in. Okay. Now that may seem like it's really limiting, but first of all, I would argue to you that physics is a Markov decision process. If, if they have a particle and it's got a trajectory, if I know that particle's current state and its trajectory, I can predict where it's going to be. I don't really know, you need to know anything about its past trajectory. Okay. So that may be a little misleading because obviously, even though it is a Markov decision process, it's an awfully complicated complex one, one that we could never really simulate with our current computers. But that does give us some hope that maybe every problem, at least every problem in theory, could be put into a Markov decision process. Okay. The other thing that makes it less um, limiting is the fact that state T could include past information if you wanted to. So if you had some piece of information from history that you thought, you know, that's an important part of what my current state is, you could just promote it to be part of the current state and then pass it in, and that would still be legal. But you're not, you're only analyzing ST and AT. Okay, so example of a Markov decision process. We've got a very simple maze here. In fact, this is such a simple maze, it has no walls. There's the start, there's the goal. You can see that there's a reward score of 100 if you get to the goal. Nothing blocking you. So how many states are there in this maze? That's a completely fair question. So there may be more than one answer here. In fact, uh, for the sake of keeping things simple, we're going to be discrete. So it's just nine, nine states. In reality, if you were making a real robot, it would have other substates. Right? So you'd have to take that in consideration somehow. That was the um, Georgia Tech uh, artificial, uh, artificial Intelligence for Robots class gets into that. About how do you actually handle that? I spent some time trying to come up with algorithms to work that out for my virtual robot that I was trying to move through a maze. Okay, so we've got nine states, and then we've got four possible actions. There could have been more. It could have been we, you could move diagonally, but we're going to define it as four possible actions. And just to keep it really simple, if you're like in this state and then you try to move down, we're going to say that's legal, but that nothing changes. The state just goes back to the same state. So you, every single state, try to keep it as simple as possible for the sake of explaining reinforcement learning. 
every state, there's nine states, every state has four actions, period, end of story. Okay. Okay, so there we go, nine states, and here's, I, I didn't draw the ones on, because I ran out of room. In theory, you could also go off the maze and it would just go back to the same state. But here are the, the legal, the productive states and actions that exist. Okay, so how might we solve this maze? Okay, how would you make a, an algorithm to solve this maze? Okay, so maybe what we would do is we would start with a, defining a state transition function as a table. Okay, so let me kind of show you here. Here's the table. This is exactly what you would expect. If you're in state one and you go right, it goes to state two. Okay, that's it could be an example of a state transition function. Okay, very simple one, obviously. Here is an example of a reward function. This is obviously a very simple reward function, but if you're at state three, you score 100, otherwise you score zero. Now, in real life, you probably would never want to do a reward function that looks like that. You'd probably want to do something like that instead, where it's negative one if you're not in the, 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 uh, the goal state. Why might that be? Can anybody make a guess as to why that might be? Right. So the robot scores exactly the same. If you put zero, the robot scores exactly the same if it gets to the goal by going versus like that. We probably want it to actually get to the fastest way there. And we probably want to get it there as fast as possible and work out the algorithm and not have it spend so much time wandering. So because of that, they, they put a negative one on there. It's just more efficient. OK. So there is an algorithm called, well, a set of algorithms, I should say, called dynamic programming. OK, now I, got, I have to ask this. And has anybody, have everybody heard of dynamic programming? Have you? OK, you, you are such a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> do, do, do you know what? A, a, a couple of years on my team talking about dynamic programming, how cool it was. And I'm like, OK, explain it. When they explained it, I went, oh, no. <laughs> it's not dynamic. So, it, do you know what? The, not, the word programming meant something different mm -hmm. back when they named it. It's got nothing to do with computer programming. It, it came from Richard Bellman, who's the one who created a lot of these algorithms. That He created the, he helped with the, he didn't create the Markov decision process, but he came up with algorithms to solve the Markov decision process. And he created this idea of dynamic programming, and there were no, electronic computer, at least they weren't widely used at the time. I think it was back in the 50s. There probably were some. But uh, so the word back then had, didn't have anything to do with computer programming. And you have to keep in mind, the word computer was a word that was borrowed from human computers that would compute things based on a program written for them. And they would call them electronic computers to differentiate them from human computers. Human computers existed before it was a job that people had. It was usually a woman, and she would do this calculation and then pass the cards around. And they said, oh, this is this, this electronic computer is doing the same thing as these human computers. And then over time, the, the term started to mean just the electronic computer. We don't even use human computers anymore. So the dynamic program is the same sort of thing, where it's referring to something else. But a dynamic programming is an algorithm that is known to solve any Markov decision process. And it will, it, what it does is it creates an optimal policy. It can create an optimal policy for the state. Now, what I mean by optimal policy, this is an example right here of an optimal policy. Okay. Notice how no matter what state you're in, it moves you optimally towards the goal. Okay. So that's what we mean by optimal policy. No matter what state you're in, we've got a policy of what you're going to do, and it will always be the right choice. Okay. So. All right, so what dynamic programming would do is it would, it would, you'd use the algorithm and it would come up with utilities for the state, okay? Now, utilities, you can see an example of how that might look right here, okay? It's fairly obvious. If the reward is 100 here, 
then being next to the reward should be worth a little less, have a utility a little less than the reward. And it kind of just degrades from there, depending on how, you know, think of it as like economic discount, discount against the future. That's what it's doing here. Okay. So dynamic programming would come up with the utilities for each state and then use that to build the optimal policy. Basically, you just move to whatever the highest um, utility is. Whatever action gives you the highest utility for the next state, that's the one you want. Now, you could probably notice here that this arrow could very easily have been here instead, and it still would have been an optimal policy. Optimal policies are not unique. Right? There could be more than one optimal policy. Okay. But in this case, dynamic programming does it by using the transition function. So the assumption of dynamic programming is I've got the transition function. It's in my computer. I can reference it any, anytime I want. Got my reward function in the computer. And based on those two things, it, it's a program, that an algorithm that looks it up, figures it out, and just automatically computes it. You could probably figure out how to use dynamic programming to get this result fairly easily without any further discussion about dynamic, dynamic programming. And you would be doing dynamic programming. Okay. So um, that's what dynamic programming does. But it, it, in that case, you actually know the transition function or, and the reward function, and you can reference them be able to get the, the utilities and turn it into an optimal policy. So what if you don't know them? Okay, so now uh, an aside for a little philosophy. So we just left, our, left ourselves off with the, the question, if only we could come up with a way to form an optimal policy without knowing the transition and reward function. Okay. That would be very powerful because in theory, any problem can be put into a Markov mark decision process. I emphasize in theory there. We wouldn't actually know how to do it to every problem. But every theory, every problem could be put into a Markov decision process. If we had a magic algorithm that didn't require knowing the transition and reward function, we could solve every problem as a Markov decision process. By the way, there is something called a, a, a COMDP, which is a probability version. So everything I'm showing you here is, uh, is uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Yeah, so, well, the way I'm explaining this, it's based on if I move north, I absolutely will move north. And I'm guaranteed to have it. Okay, it's, it's, um, word will come to me. But there's a probability version of it where maybe somebody bumps into you instead. Something else happens that you couldn't have foreseen. There's, there's a version of all this for that. It's just more complicated. So, okay, so, now, this guy here is Alan Turing. Just kidding. <laughs> so there's a guy named Alan Turing. Who knows who Alan Turing is? Okay, good. Good, good, good. He's kind of famous now, probably because, in part because of the movie. You may have learned about him in the computer science program, too. Um, what is he, I've got to be careful when I say this, what is he most famous for? And let's, and let's specify, I'm not looking for the Turing test. That is probably what he's actually most famous for. But what is he most famous for? Algorithms. 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 What is, what is, get, let's get more specific. What, what is he really most famous for? Is Church Turing? Is, yeah. Church, is, is church is, explain that further. No. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. did the presentation at this meeting, at this group. Uh, there's Turing and there's Church, and they both presented a uh, universal model of completeness. And so we now usually call it the Church Turing thesis. Uh, and the universal model of completeness is uh, a definition of what would be a universal machine for solving the universal model. Uh, anything that um, a Turing complete machine is capable of, of solving any problem that can provide an algorithm to solve, it can implement, be used to exercise any algorithm. Yes. And if you have an algorithm that can solve your problem, a Turing complete machine can use it to solve your problem. Okay. So, trick. This is definitely a trick question. Is a computer Turing complete? Today's computers mm -hmm. are. Are they? Yes. They are, as they are implemented right now, Turing complete, but the question is flawed, not the answer that you're looking for. The question it asks if Turing, it makes the assumption that Turing completeness is the only thing to consider, and it's not. 
there are problems that cannot be solved by a Turing complete machine because <laughs> they are not solved by algorithms as we put forth the Turing machine. Okay, so I'd actually like to talk to you about that because I, I'm not aware of anything that can be solved except by algorithms. So a turn. Well, I, I got nothing to say to you. Okay, all right. <laughs> but, but we know, we, we believe that there are, we, we know that there are problems that we can solve that, that, that we can't that can be solved and yeah. we don't have algorithms. That's right. And in fact, we even know problems that would be nice to solve that, there, that we've got proofs that there is no algorithm for. Okay, there are unsolvable or uncomputable problems. The halting problem is the same as well. So, okay, so let me, let me back up and try to just explain all that just a, a, a little bit. Um, Turing came up with, he's most famous for the Turing machine, which is a, a hypothetical computer. Computers didn't exist in his time, so he came up with a model for a computer and how it would work. He wasn't worried about the engineering side of it, he was a mathematician. So he imagined this machine, I think I've got a picture of one. He imagined this machine that had tape, and the tape could read or write from the tape, and had a head that would move back and forth, reading or writing, or the tape would move, rather, read or write against the head. And so he had memory, and he imagined that, that the head had a processor, and it had certain things it could do, and he was able to prove um, that, uh, so no, he wasn't able to prove it. Let me, let me be careful how I say this. He the machine he came up with, this hypothetical machine called the Turing machine, he conjectured that any algorithm you could imagine, the machine could run. Now, he never was able to find a proof that that was the case. Okay, so that's why they call it the Church Turing thesis. All right? And in fact, they actually disproved it uh, a decade or so ago, slightly. And they had to change the church turn thesis to be the church turn Deutsch thesis. Deutsch found the exception. The exception was very esoteric. I'm not even sure I could explain it to you. But it has to do with quantum computation. That's my other presentation over here. And quantum computation, insofar as I even could make sense of Deutsch's papers, he's one of my favorite authors, by the way, but Deutsch's papers was that a quantum computer can actually do full analog, whereas a Turing machine is always a digital um, approximation of analog. Okay. Now, there's a question, what can you do with full analog that you can't do with the approximation of analog? But bear in mind that a computer can approximate analog to any level of arbitrary, um, you know, as you can get as closely approximate as you want, right? So you just give it more and more memory to approximate. So it's arbitrary. It's not like it's limited to how close to the analog it can get. Right. The types of things you can do with a quantum computer that you can't do with a Turing machine are super esoteric. I, I, I don't think you could possibly conceive what an example, right? It's so esoteric. Um, on the other hand, a quantum machine, a quantum computer, can compute some things much faster than a uh, Turing machine. Shor's algorithm for breaking encryption. So, but that would just be a case of a speed up. Nothing about the Turing machine. There's all sorts of ways you could speed up a Turing machine. It would be awfully slow compared to a modern computer. But a modern computer cannot compute anything that a Turing machine can compute. And if the Turing machine has a computable, uh, if, if, if the algorithm is intractable on a Turing machine, it will also be intractable on modern computer. Okay, so now to answer the question, is a modern computer a Turing machine? Is it Turing complete? It's totally a trick question. I would say yes. I think technically the answer would be no on the grounds that a modern computer has finite memory whereas the Turing machine has infinite memory. It's just a hypothetical machine. So of course it did. So, and that seems unfair. So I would say a modern computer approximately is a Turing complete machine. So, uh, as close as you could possibly get in real life. So, and they're actually very similar. In fact, if you think about it, this is the CPU. It's got a processor. It writes against memory. It, it's, it's really, obviously this wasn't intentional, but the von Neumann architecture actually just very closely approximates. One big difference is you can go anywhere on the tape instantly. You don't have to move back and forth. So I would obviously say time. If anyone's interested, uh, Bruce's previous presentation on quantum computing uh, is... 
edited, uploaded, but not published. I'll publish it here shortly. We're just doing the view on it. Uh, and so you'll be able to find that on our YouTube channel. You'll also find my presentation on Turing machines up there, and that's there now. And I go over a small discussion about how you can actually implement today's computers, their approximation, using an actual Turing machine, if, it, if you want to make oh, sense cool. of that. That's cool. I don't know if it's any good, but it's in there. It was actually like a talk. Okay, so Turing was famous for the Turing machine, which really means what he was famous for was inventing computational theory. Okay? Computational theory existed before computers, right? And so I'm, I had a, a, a physics buddy who I said, oh, David Deutsch is famous for, he's, he's famous for um, inventing computational theory. He goes, oh, no, he didn't invent the quantum computer. I go, well, nobody's invented the quantum computer. They don't. You know, we don't know how to engineer them yet. It says, but quantum computational theory already exists. Right? That's a, a well-understood body of scientific knowledge. And the, you know, the engineering of the quantum computer is based on that. But it's, it's just I get it. I get it. theoretical at this point. So a Church-Turing thesis. Now let's talk about that for a second. So the Church-Turing thesis was that the Turing machine is a universal computer. Okay, Not proven but there's not a single known counterexample except for the one counterexample I just gave you with quantum computing. Okay, so there's not a single known counterexample to, to that. If there's, if there's an algorithm, the Turing machine can run it, and there's no way to create a machine that can process it. Um, I'll be careful how I say this. That can, that can um, there's different classes of programs when we talk about P versus NP, things like that. P being polynomial time, NP usually um, is a class that may not be polynomial. Uh, basically, if it's polynomial on one, it's polynomial on all of them, is what it comes down to. If it's not polynomial, it may be that it's just an intractable problem, or it may just be non computable. Well, they, they do, they do. MP complete, yeah. right. Okay, so now this guy here is a world-famous physicist that you've never heard of named Roger Penrose. You probably have heard his name, and it never occurred to you that you've heard it multiple times, because it seems like once you know who he is, you hear about him all the time. And he was even in the movie um, Theory of Everything, because he was Stephen Hawking's uh, advisor. And so he's, they got an actor playing him, of course, who, by the way, looks a lot like him. But uh, um, he is super famous amongst physicists and gets quoted by non-physicists you know, all the time. He gets quoted by religious philosophers, things like that. Um, he pointed out that there was actually a little bit of a difference between Church's thesis and Turing's thesis. Church was more conservative, and he said, uh, insofar, and this is what I think you were actually saying, Insofar as something can be solved by an algorithm, the church Turing machines, there are different types of machines, but the church Turing machines can both solve them. But it was leaving open the possibility that maybe there was non-algorithmic somethings out there. Turing took the stance that everything was algorithmic. All of nature was algorithmic. And that therefore, all of it was simulatable on a Turing machine. Okay. Now remember, this is a theory. Okay. And you're welcome to have your own opinions on that. But there are no known counterexamples to Turing's thesis. Okay? Penrose, who doesn't believe in Turing's thesis, by the way, admits that that's true. We don't really know of any counterexamples. And he says Turing's thesis, he's going to call the Turing principle because it's a stronger thesis. And it's reality can always be simulated on a universal computer. Now, this guy, David Deutsch, I just mentioned him, one of my favorite authors. He um, pointed out that physics is based on the assumption, whether people realize it or not, it's based on the assumption that the Turing principle is correct. And when they go out and they're trying to explore physics and they're trying to create mathematics to, to model it, that's what they're doing. They're assuming that the Turing principle is correct, and it's moving forward with that assumption. And there's really no other assumption they can make. Right? It's not that I can think of, right? which is why I challenged you a little on that. Right? It's, it could be there's something out there that's non-algorithmic, but then it would be impersonable to science. Right? Science would be able to describe it at all. So, because it wouldn't be mathematically describable. So, 
he suggested that we should use accept the Turing principle as our current best scientific theory. And I, I believe he's correct about that. Without stating that it is known to be true, because it is not known to be true, it is our best scientific theory on the subject. Now, what does this have to do with what we're talking about? I'll come back to that. Okay, so now we're going to talk about a Q learner, which is a specific type of reinforcement learner. We're going to get into the guts now of how to do a really simple reinforcement learning algorithm. And so I, I know this is like really easy. I'm sorry to insult your intelligence by even putting it up here. It's just, I mean, it's so obvious. I'm sorry to even have to put it up there. Okay, but you know, it's, this is it. This is how come it all works. Isn't that great? Isn't that lovely? All right. I took all this from Tom Mitchell's book, by the way. And uh, it's a very dense book that's like this all the way through. And took a long, I, I, there's still parts of that book that I just have no clue what he was saying. But uh, I'm going to take you through these equations so that they make sense, at least to get the gist of what they are. There's something very cool that Mitchell is explaining when he takes you through this. That when I got the aha, I thought, oh, I want to show this to other people, which is why I'm including it into this presentation. And it is the basis for why reinforcement learning works, right? It's, it's this theoretical construct of math that demonstrates that reinforcement learning should work, and it does, okay? So I want to take you through it, because I feel like then you have a much deeper understanding of what's really going on with reinforcement learning. Okay, so we're going to start with quick review. Reward function is, hey, at this state you get a reward. Value function is, is the expected utility of this the utility of the state. Notice that rewards and utilities are not the same thing. There's only one reward. At state three, you get 100. Everything else is zero. But the utility of a state is a discounting of the expected rewards. Okay. Or not, because it, it makes the math just so much harder to follow. So we're going to st stick with zero, even though negative one is the way you would do it in real life. Okay. So the transition function is a list of what actions uh, move you from state to state. I already gave an example of that, of that table. So there, you kind of cuts part of it off. But so we're gonna we're going to talk about the Q function. Now the Q function, they make it up because it's important to the mathematical proof I'm about to show you. But all it really is is that I'm assigning the utility to the action instead of the state. I don't fill the whole thing out because it was tedious. But if you're in this state, this action gives you 100 points. So instead of having 100 points at state 3, you get 100 points for an action that moves you to state 3. It gives you slightly different utilities, but it's the same idea. And you get a utility of 81 for moving away from state 2 like this because you're moving further away from the reward. So you're assigning utilities to the actions instead of the states. You could obviously translate between the Q function and the utility function by just simply saying, OK, if I'm in this state, which of my actions gives me the highest reward? And in this case, it's 100. We've assigned 100 here. Before, I had it assigned here. A little bit different, like I said, but it's the exact same idea. Okay. OK, so the optimal value function created from the Q function would look like this then. Okay. So slightly different than the one that I would have done with dynamic you can see the idea is the same, right? OK, and then the final optimal policy is going to be something like this that says, in this state, take this move. And then by following that policy, you'll always end up with an optimal result, getting to the goal state as quickly as possible. OK, so now let's start with the first equation. This says, so the V is the value function, OK? The pi there. That just means a policy. We're not yet talking about the optimal policy. Imagine some non-optimal policy that hops around the squares for a while and eventually gets you to, to the reward. Okay, the value of that policy, if you're in state at a given time t, would be the reward at time t plus a discount factor of all future rewards. Okay, notice that as you go further into the future, the discount factor gets squared and then three times and fourth exponential, and you just keep going, exactly like economics. You know anything from economics to an economics class where you're discounting the future, net present value, exact same idea. Okay, so you're discounting the future. So that's how come 
you get a higher utility if the policy is optimal, and you get a higher utility if you're closer to the goal. Okay. So that's really all it's saying at this point. Okay, so right there was. All right, so now we're going to define what the optimal policy is. So remember, this meant policy. That means optimal policy. Okay. So it's basically the argmax of the uh, the value, the utility, or the value of a given policy at state s for any given state s. Okay. Argmax just simply means the ma whatever the maximum, whatever moves you to the maximum utility or value. Take that one. Take the argument that the action in this case is the argument that takes you there. Okay, so that, that seems obvious too, right? This is actually fairly basic. This is the thing that's interesting. Most of these are super basic once you actually understand them. And they're just moving from one slight little logical leap to the next. Okay, so here would be the optimal value function. We've seen that before. And there would be an optimal policy as defined right there. Okay, so. See, I went backwards, didn't I? Oh, no. This is. Yeah, okay. This is it. Okay. So this is um, defining the optimal policy just like we did before, except instead of defining it in total, we're defining it for a single state S. Okay. Other than that, it's the same, the same thing. The way you would do that for a single state S is you take the hard max of the reward at that state, taking that action, plus the discounted value of the optimal policy from that point forward. That's the transition function, remember? So it just means the next state. You see, transition SA, it means whatever state you end up, ended up in for taking action A. Oops. Okay, does that make sense? You see why that would be true? Any questions about that? It's actually fairly self-evidently true if you got it. If you don't got it, then you're a little confused, yeah. I don't know if I got it or not, but it's I, it, if I understand what I'm looking at, isn't that um, looking just one move ahead? Yes. But okay, well, then, sort of, sort of. Given an optimal policy, right? Oh. Okay. So an optimal policy technically is looking every move ahead. Well. But. But it's already. It's already determined. It's pre yes. It's pre-computed. Okay. So okay. if you. You have to. You have to substitute this, something in there. That you do. Use a different different economics. Okay, so we don't actually know how yet. I haven't shown it how to compute it, right? But if you had it, this would be the correct number. Okay, and at this point, they're just playing with with mathematical equations to demonstrate something. But consider that that's what I'm about to show you is how reinforcement learning estimates the utility function, thereby allows you. So, okay, so this is fairly straightforward how you define an optimal policy at state S. And it's self-evidently true given the fact that you are assuming you have the optimal policy. All right, now we're going to take the, talk about the Q function. This is how we define the Q function. Q function is simply, it's really the same as what we just did except that it's, um, we're adding state instead of just being based on like the last equation based on the state, no, based on the state and the action. So obviously it's defined as the reward for a given state and action plus the discounted optimal policy of the next state. Okay, does that make sense? You see why that would be true? And this is tautologically true. So this is how they define the Q function. Okay. All right, so now we have a definition of the optimal policy based on state. And we have a definition of the uh, optimal value function based on state. Okay. But notice now what I'm doing a little differently is I'm saying, okay, I can actually define both of these based on the Q function. Oh, of course I can. Right? But so an optimal policy of state S is the argmax using the argument of the action of the Q value of S and A. Okay, so basically, remember we said 
you just take the best action in a given state, well, of course that would be identical to the optimal policy. And of course, if I took the value instead of the ar argument, it would be equivalent to the utility, the optimal utility of the state. Okay, does that seem obvious too? Okay. Okay, so obvious example, you're in state five. You would have four values of Q available to you because you can make four possible moves. You know, you could do Q five up, five down, five left, right, five left. Q up and right would both have a value of 90 because they would be closer to the goal. Um, left and down would have a lower value because they would be further away from the goal. And if you wanted to translate into the value function, you would just take the maximum value, just like it's saying. And if you want to transfer it into the optimal policy, you would just simply take the action that is the highest value you want. Okay, so now here's the beautiful part. So we have, this is where everything up to this point is really kind of self-evident once you understand the notation. This is where somebody smart got really clever. Okay. So we have the optimal optimal, uh, not that this is the optimal utility of the value function, V is for the value function, of state S is equal to the max, by the way, I didn't quite explain this, but the reason why I, I put a, a apostrophe next to the A is because obviously in the Q function it would actually be the action of the next state, not the action you took to get to that state. So I'm just differentiating. It's the same idea though. So we have that, and then we have, okay, that's self-evidence based on the graph. Uh, then we have the Q value, uh, therefore the Q, Q value of state S in action A is equal to the max rewards. Got to walk over here so I can finish talking. The reward of the current state S and A plus the discounted maximum value of the next reward that you're, you're going to receive for the next action and being in the next state. There's the transition function there. Okay? Notice what I've done. Does that seem obvious why that would be true? We're really just substituting in the other equations. We're just saying, okay, we got this. We knew this equation was true. We agreed this equation was true. Substitute them. And we now have Q defined in terms of itself. Okay, this is why it gets clever. So we're just substituting two previous equations. We're saying, okay, this is the definition of Q. It's based on the value function. We said the value function would be defined in terms of Q. Substitute them across. You get this right there. Okay, where Q is defined in terms of itself. It's a recursive function at this point. Okay. Now notice though that we still haven't gotten rid of the transition function, which is what we're trying to do. We're trying to somehow mathematically drop the transition function out. Okay. Okay, so um, what this does though is because we've got now got this defined recursively. There is now a process that is known that will iteratively approximate uh, the optimal Q function. Okay. Basically, what you do is you start with an estimate of Q. Okay. So imagine you had a, a Q function, which can just be a table with all the state possible states and actions. And imagine you just come up with an approximation of an optimal Q. Now, maybe that approximation is a really, really bad approximation. In fact, for the sake of argument, let's say it's the worst possible approximation. It's zero in every state in action. So it treats every action in every state as exactly the same value, zero. Okay, so there's no way to pick a better one. All right? You're basically randomly moving around. Okay? Even with a random, you know, random values or all zeros in the Q function, that's still a good enough approximation to get the process started. Use this as the algorithm. Select an action and execute it. Receive immediate reward. You know what that is. Reward can come from the environment, even though you may not know what the function is. In the case of stocks. Okay. Observe the new state that you ended up in. That state becomes the new current state. And then update the, the Q table entry as follows. And this is a little bit misleading, but it's the new Q value of S and A will be moved towards, that's what that means, 
ones right there, <clears throat> will converge towards whatever reward you received here, plus a discounted factor of what, you current, what your current estimated Q function is for the new state that you just wound up in, okay. based on the, the, best val the best action that you know of in that state. Okay. Now, how do you do converge towards? I'll show you in a second, but basically you take 80% of the old value, 20% of the new value, and you average between them and move it that much further towards it, and it slowly converges towards it. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to try to go over this one more time, just real quick, and show you how this kind of all comes together. So we have all these functions. We have the optimal policy defined by the Q function. Notice that um, these two functions are identical. Here, Q is defined the same as the argmax portion of the optimal policy. Notice that these two are the same. Notice that these two are the same. Okay. So then we have the optimal value function defined in terms of Q. This is slightly different than the other green boxes. The only difference is that you're taking the max next action. But it's spiritually exactly the same. Therefore, you can do it in terms of a recursive function. Notice how these two still match. The only difference here is that now we're throwing the reward on in, but that was assumed here. And notice this one is really the same as this. A slightly different for the next state instead of the current state. Next state in action instead of the current state in action. Which leads us to the Q function being able to recursively update itself and converge based on an estimate. Okay, notice that these are the same also. Okay. All right, what we care about though is finding the optimal policy. So here's what you do Q function can be estimated from the real world based on actual rewards plus our current estimated Q function, even if it's a bad estimate. The Q function can create optimal value function. The optimal value function can create an optimal policy. So using the Q function and real world, real, real world rewards, we do not need to know what the reward and transition functions are. We can just estimate them and converge towards the correct answer. Okay. Now, there is one gotcha with this. It only actually converges mathematically to the right answer at infinity. <laughs> what it does is way before infinity, it converges towards something close to the right answer. And when I actually ran this in real life, and I'll show you some of my, my runs, there's always, it, like you look at its optimal policy, and there's always like three states that you just know are wrong, but all the rest of them are right, or, or something along those lines, right? And so it, it, it never quite gets to the optimal policy, but it's close. And in many, many cases, that's what you want. It's just something close. Okay. So, okay, so we can learn the Q function from any unknown function, as long as it's framed as a Markov decision process. Um, it has to have some way to value natural rewards. That would be one thing. And it has to be trackable. Okay, but remember the church Turing thesis says everything is just a hidden function. All of reality is just a hidden function. That's our best scientific theory at the moment. It is these two things together that lead to comments like this. Reinforcement learning seems to be a general learning algorithm that can be applied to a variety of environments. It may even be the first step towards a general artificial intelligence. I don't know if that's actually true, but you can get it, gather the excitement around it because unlike every other machine learning algorithm we've got, it looks like it might be a general algorithm, a general learning algorithm. It can learn, in theory, anything. Okay. Now, <laughs> What's that? Enough time. With enough time, yes. Well, to be honest, the hardest part is trying to frame the problem as a Markov decision process. You have to figure out how to do that first. It takes some human intelligence to get, get the process started. Um, the, the thing that I find kind of interesting about this, though, is in real life, reinforcement learning doesn't have many wins yet. It's a new enough area that's being studied. There's tons of excitement around it. 
I've got an article, I'll, I'll show you if you're interested, where a guy who's one of the leaders in reinforcement learning states that when people ask him if reinforcement learning is ready to solve their problems, he answers, no, it's not, and he knows he'll be right 70% of the time. <laughs> um, it turns out that I mean, the reason why there's all this excitement is because of AlphaGo, right? It, it, it was usable to solve what they thought was an impossible problem to solve using machine learning. Um, but AlphaGo, being a game, you can go make it play itself a million billion times, and it can learn from that data. And there aren't that many things in real life where you can do that, right? I mean, if just in terms of like if you made a robot, first of all, it would break itself as it's running through a maze a million times bumping into walls. Secondly, you just wouldn't have the time to do it in real life because it takes actual time. It can't run fast enough. But there's a great deal of excitement around the fact that there's so much potential here. And that it was, in fact, you probably all heard about how China is getting into machine learning. It was because AlphaGo beat their master. They freaked out over that and said, oh my gosh, there's something big here. We need to get into it. Now they're using it to be tyrannical and to watch the populace and you know, things like that. And it turns out machine learning is good at stuff like that. So it can you know, use it to have every policeman have a little camera. And it, as it's looking at faces, it flags and says, oh, go ask him a question. He, he might be an enemy of the state looks at your actions and determines if you're going to, in the future, be an enemy of the state. Things like that. It's, machine learning is very good at things like that. Um, but it kind of does show why there's so much excitement around reinforcement learning. Okay, and there's a lot of potential. If you ever wanted to go back to school and study something, this would be an area that would be super interesting to study because we haven't made very many breakthroughs yet. There's a lot of breakthroughs to go, most likely. OK, so machine learning is really about modeling reality's hidden functions. This is why I feel I'm excited about machine learning, is because I believe that all reality is functions, and that trying to model them is very cool. Right? And this is you think about like a lot of the breakthroughs that have come through recent deep learning, which is supervised learning. But it was because nobody knew how to write an algorithm that could recognize a face, much less a specific person's face. We still don't know how to write such an algorithm. That's very effective. But we can write a deep learning algorithm that can write its own algorithm that works really well, and we're not quite sure how it does it. <laughs> okay, this is what's very cool about machine learning, and reinforcement learning is the most general form of machine learning so far. Okay, so now let's talk about in practice how this actually works. I've done tons of theory up to this point, and wanted you to understand why I found was very excited about the theory behind it. How does it actually work in practice? Okay, so here's our Here's our Q table. Has every state, every action, and our current estimate, which is zero for everything. We've got our um, states. We've, we've got, we know what our states are. We know what our actions are. We've got our Q learning algorithm that I've explained. In real life, you do it something like this, where you can't quite see it, but where you would um, have a, a learning rate, and you would um, approximate. One, this is 1.0 minus the learning rate times the learning rate and the value that you're calculating here, and you let it converge slowly over time. Based on this, let's, come, let's demonstrate how this could be used for a robot to solve our little simple maze here. So we've got a robot, and we've got a reward function. And this robot, it, it's, its approximation is 0, so it's just moving randomly. right? It, it, it's got no reason to prefer one action over another. By chance, it winds up in state two at some point, next to the goal. And by chance, it moves into the goal. Or it's going to in a second. But before we do that, well. okay, by chance, it moves into the goal and gains a reward of 100. Here's our Q function. You know, I'm using a learning rate of 20%. So we take the old value times 80 and 20% of the reward plus the discount. This is discount of 90%, discounted of the max value of the next state. So in this case, what that turns out to be is this. 80% times 0, because that was a current estimate. 
times 20% of 100 times 90% of 0, or 20. So I update my Q table to be 20. Okay, so for state 2, taking a right, the estimated value is now 20. Okay. Well, right now, everything else is still 0. So I run my algorithm again, and my robot's randomly moving around the, the maze again. And let's say it, just by chance, winds up in state 1. Eventually, it will, by chance, wind up in state 1. And it's in state 1, and by chance, it moves to state 2. Well, in this case, <clears throat> there's a Q value there that isn't 0. As long as it's all 0, the update just keeps updating it back to 0. Because okay? so I've got no reason to prefer it. In this case, it has a preference. It says, oh, there's a higher utility for moving right in this state than any of the other moves. So we update our Q function according to our formula, like this, and our value comes up to be 3.6. Feel free to check my math. I've had done this presentation, people have told me it's wrong. It's because I'm bad at math, but you get the idea here. Okay. Um, so 3.6 gets updated into state 1, move right, has a 3.6. Now, you can kind of see where this is going, where it's slowly starting to perpetuate away from the goal back towards the start state. Okay? That's precisely what it's going to do. Okay. So now, because it's in state 2 and it has a preference of 20, it knows to move towards the goal, and it gets the reward again. Then we set it back. So that we do an update to the Q value. It going to move from 20 to 36 now. Okay. And then we set it back to the start again. Imagine doing that over and over, and we slowly start to converge towards the correct Q values because they perpetuate out from the reward that's being received. Okay. We might end up, this is made up obviously, but we might end up with something that looks like this, where the highest values are the correct ones. So you can get an optimal policy off of it. The utilities aren't really correct. They're just approximately. Okay, but, but your run at the of the that's correct. Every time it runs through, it gets better at it. Okay. So they call it mean by training. Yes, uh, yes. So you go through a training phase here, and it, it trains on it, and then you, you know, and then eventually it gets to the point where it can run it really well. And in fact, in, in a maze like this, it, it would converge towards the optimal policy. It would find the optimal policy. In slightly larger, more complicated maze with pit traps and things like that, it would like miss one or two, right? A hundred select between, but it, it would, and it would be ones that are off the beaten path that it would never get to except by chance. You know, maybe this is a palm DP instead, and there's a chance it gets off the path and tries to use its motors and it accidentally goes a different way or something like that. It, so it may reach that non-optimal state, but it'll eventually get back into an optimal state and move on. Okay, now there's one. So we're slowly converging towards the correct Q values. Okay, um, there is one problem that has to be solved, and it turns out it's easy to solve. And that is, what if you initially start off with a non-optimal uh, run? Let's say that you happen to go like this and get there, and then you happen to do that again, and you happen to do that again, and you happen to do that again. The values in the Q value would end up doing that. It would be the worst possible run according to the Q values. And you see how that might happen. It's not likely to happen, but it could happen. Okay, what you would actually do in real life to avoid that is you would do something called the explore-exploit trade-off. Okay? Basically, sometimes you would just explore. You would ignore your Q values and just pick a random direction so that you can try to learn the Q values as good as possible. Um, and then part of the time, you would exploit your current knowledge and follow it. Okay. Then what you do is during the training phase, you would slowly make the trade-off happen less often. So you'd start off maybe 99.9% .9 of the time just moving randomly. All the values are zero anyhow, so you're going to move randomly anyhow. And then each time you run through the maze, you would have some little factor. You would reduce the export export trade-off. And then slowly over maybe 10,000 runs or something, you would move towards where you're almost always just exploiting your knowledge. 
right? And you would figure out what that value is. This is an example of a hyperparameter, by the way. You would figure out what that example, what that number is, based on actually trying it out and seeing what actually works. Okay. So now, I don't have a real demo. Um, I could show you, but it would just be exactly what you see here. But here is an actual maze that I was running for my class. Let me explain this real quick. Do you see the ones right there? Those are the, those are the walls. Okay. This is the starting point right there, too. Those are pit traps. The robot falls into a pit, and you get a negative 1,000 reward or something like that. And so the optimal path, and then also it's not deterministic. That's the term I keep trying to remember. It's somewhat probabilistic. It's not deterministic. If I tell the robot to move forward, it might accidentally slip into the side or something like that instead. There's a 10% chance it goes one of the other directions. So based on that, you would, this, this isn't the optimal path because it gets you close to the pit traps, which might means you fall in and get a negative 1,000 reward. Okay? So it will actually come up with a, a policy that moves you away from the pit trap and over to the goal. And it, it does it, it's like magic. It just, you run it, go through the training phase, and it comes with the policy. You can see that the policy is not optimal. Okay, where, where it's, it's, this one in particular is pretty bad because it will actually get into an infinite loop. It won't actually be an infinite loop because remember the robot by chance will happen to move off of it within some reasonable number of others. Okay, but this would be an example of how it's not really an optimal policy. And the reason why is because during my runs, the robot didn't explore over there enough, right? So it, it never converged towards the right value. But the odds you'll ever wind up here are not strong, okay? It's mostly going to just follow that policy right there and get right over to, to the goal, okay? All right, does, does that make sense? And, and do you have a good feel now at this point for how it mathematically is able to estimate the transition without the transition function is able to estimate a uh, decent policy. Okay, now, here's where things get interesting. This is, this is the end, by the way. In the machine learning for trading class, we first did a grid world, that's what they call it, where you have a, a virtual robot that runs a grid. We then took the exact same Q-learning function. It's, it's the, we did not change it. It was the identical Q-learning function. We had to wrap it to have different states. But we created a trading algorithm using the same Q-learning function. And the Q-learning function will learn trading just as readily as it will learn how to run a robot through a grid world. Okay? It, it does not care what it's trying to learn. <laughs> it just, just automatically works. Now, the trick here, of course, and this was the result, by the way. This is kind of a crazy result. But what we have here, <coughs> is um, my portfolio, how much money it earned. Now, this is training data, so this is kind of cheating, but it, it gives you a feel. And obviously, it's going to perform way stronger on training data than test data. But it way outperforms. Um, my, my, this is my manual method, where even looking at the data, I did the absolute best I could strategy, and this was the best I could figure out. And here is my benchmark, which is basically just buy the stock by the stock and hold. Okay. Now this is a particularly bad time period for JP Morgan. This was uh, the, uh, the, the crisis. Um, and right here you can see the red lines are go short and the green lines are go long. And it, it, it's doing it all the time. By the way, has anybody read recently about the Watson algorithm ETF? It's underperforming the market. One of the reasons why is because it trades too much. So you can see here that the te that tendency exists. But uh, that was what it did. Now, and he, he, how, do, how, do you, how do you make this algorithm work? Now, since my Q-learner is discrete and can't handle any possible value, there is a way to approximate the function using like neural nets or something like that. And you could approximate a non-discrete function. But <clears throat> to keep it simple, something that you'd reasonably do in a single semester. What we did is we took different signals, right? The typical technical signals. This is a 90-day Bollinger Band. 
Bollinger Band is um, two deviations away from the mean for the last 90 days. Okay. There's a way to mathematically translate it into a single signal. I can't remember off the top of my head how you do it, but it, it's a well-known thing that you do, or some sort of subtraction or something. You can see. Turn it into a single signal. Now, the first thing I had to do is I had to turn it into a discrete signal. So I mathematically turn it into a discrete signal. You can see how it looks like the same signal, except that now it has discrete values. In this case, I'm going 0 to 7, but in real life, I just did 0 to, zero to 9, so 10 possible values. Then I didn't have one technical signal. I made up like 3 or 4, and that would mean I have like 100,000 or something like that states. So a lot of states, because I'm just taking them and combining them together. The first, the first uh, First digit is this one, maybe. The next digit is the next one. You just move on, and you can get prime number states. At some point, I found it became intractable. In fact, it was, it was like instantaneous. You would have a certain number of signals, and it would be very tractable, and you would add one more, and it would never come back. I don't remember exactly where that happened at, but it, was, it, was, it didn't slow down slowly. It just exponentially, boom, died. Um, but based on this, I would take these discrete signals, those would be the states, and then I just run the Q learner on it. Now, here is my final out of strategy, uh, stra final, my strategy out of sample. Okay, so this is test data now. You can see that we've got, didn't do nearly so well as the training data, obviously. But we can see we've got um, my portfolio, one out. My manual method was so bad that it just, it just did the benchmark, and then at one point here it diverged and made a little money. And the, um, the, the benchmark, which is just buy and hold, did the worst. Okay. So it, it, still, it still beat out, um, even when you're doing out of sample, it still beat out just my, my attempts to manually do it. I've got to tell you how hard it was to come up with a manual strategy. I, mean, I, I tried one thing after another. Most of them just lost money. And I, I was really surprised when I ran Q learner and it beat me instantly, like every single time. So <laughs> it, it was kind of impressive. And I think that was the point of the class, was to get you to realize that. Well, some of this stuff, um, the reason why some of the stuff sounds so fulfilling to me was reading a book on data mining. And they're using a lot of the machine learning techniques to mine all the data that like my corporation network are keeping. Right. We've got 16 terabytes of data to plot through. Right. Yes, same sort of thing. Um, and here's the trades that I did on this final strategy. Now, I do have to tell you, being a rebel, on my next class, uh, that was machine learning for trading. My next class after that was the machine learning class. And they covered some of the same material near the end. So they were covering reinforcement learning. So I was doing grid worlds. So I took the stuff I had done for machine learning for trading, and I tried to expand it out to see what the result was. And I intentionally tried to find a harder problem for it to do. Now, the idea here is that it's really, it's learning a maze, right? But if you were to have it learn a maze, then give it a totally different maze, the alpha policy wouldn't apply anymore. Well, arguably, the stock market might be like that. Maybe things change so much that the Q learner has learned how it used to be, and it's nothing to do with how it is today. In fact, that's why they have problems with all machine learning algorithms where they have to keep updating them is because what they say is the probability distribution has changed. So you trained it on one probability distribution based on whatever, whatever factor. You don't know what they are. You don't know what the transition function is. You don't know what the factors are. But you're training on it. You're modeling that function. And then, of course, in the real world, the function changes over time. So you make this algorithm that's so great at buying and selling, and then you give it a totally different circumstance, and it just chokes. So what I did is I went and I found a, a stock where, so the key thing here was that my, my training set was 2008 when, during the crisis through 2003, I think. And this one goes 2004 to 2010. For J.P. Morgan, they had a fairly, I mean, you just look at it, 2008. Um, did I do that wrong? Yeah, the 2010 to 2011. Sorry, I was looking at the, okay. So 2008, 2009, and then 2010 to 2011, okay? If you look at 
JP Morgan during those times, they looked the same. I mean, you could just look at them and immediately your brain goes, oh, those look really similar, right? Because they're similar, that's why the algorithm's good, right? So I looked at Microsoft. Microsoft did terrible from 2008 to 2009. And then it went during 2010 and 2011, okay? So I thought, oh, there's no way this is going to work. And it, it still made money when I did it, but it did not make as much money as just buying Microsoft and holding it. And the reason why is because it kept trying to trade out and trade back in, and, and it was going so fast up during that time period. So there would be a real life limitation to reinforcement learning here and why there is still, I mean, obviously, if this really works and anyone can just go write a simple algorithm like this and then go make money on the market, everyone would do it, right? So there's, there's still a lot more to it than that. You gotta pick the right signals, you gotta understand the market, and then you've gotta be right. You know, if you're picking signals that were true for a certain period and then not true for the next period, you're still, you're still hosed, right? So. <laughs> All right, that's it. Any questions? Yeah, what, what sort of applications are you aware that they're doing with this besides AlphaGo? Okay, so, For but example, I think this has to be being used in weather prediction. That's what it has to be. I'm not really sure but, if it's used in weather prediction. Well, but that would probably make sense. So, okay, let me tell you, I've, I've seen, like, if you know how you'll see, like, they train a little virtual body to walk? So, and this is why that the quote I gave you of the guy who said that 70% of the time you just you know you, you're just better off not using reinforcement learning right now. I've seen them do that with reinforcement learning; it works. But you can do the same thing quicker with supervised learning, mm -hmm. right? It's it's hard to come up with. There's tons of examples I can give you because it's a general algorithm. It can do almost anything. But there's almost always a better way to do it right now because we under, we've, we've researched supervised learning more deeply than reinforcement learning. We understand it better. We know how to get better results with it. So there probably aren't that many applications where reinforcement learning will work on anything, but there probably aren't that many applications where you wouldn't be better off just using supervised learning at this point. Well, that's why I thought weather would be good because they have no dang clue. They got no dang clue. Yeah. <laughs> they have a better clue than you think. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like just seems like they have no dang clue. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and that and like I said, there's the other limitations that, that we mentioned. Right now, reinforcement learning is absolutely at its best if you can put it into a circumstance where it can generate its own data. Right? It's a game, some some place where you can let it come up with its own data set to learn off of. That's where it's really gonna shine which makes it somewhat limited. I think stock trading is one of the few exceptions where it is extensively used in stock trading. They, they use all kinds of machine learning in stock trading, not just reinforcement learning, but it is extensively used in stock trading. And you can see how it could be valuable. In this case, I was treating it more like supervised learning, where I had a training data and then I used a test data just to try it out. In real life, you'd probably want it to keep updating its Q value constantly. You would not want to just have a training phase. You'd want it to keep getting better over time. And so you can see how reinforcement learning would be particularly good for stock trading because of that. Well, it'd get better over time until you had one of those events like with Microsoft. Everything shifted. Yeah. And then it's all, you're starting the game all over again. Yeah. It would, it would have to relearn the Q values at that point. It would relearn them. And then it, I mean, you could make the case that at some point it relearns them just as it changes again, you know. Or Microsoft is a good bet across the board because it made, it's made so much money since then. I mean, it's just been, it's been one of my strongest winners in my own portfolio. You know, that and Apple are my two strongest winners, and no surprises there. Um, but then again, you wouldn't have, it's easy to say that after the fact like this, oh, right? Yeah. But you wouldn't know. Completely. You wouldn't know. And that's why you're using something like a Q learner is you're trying to, distill some wisdom that no human could possibly figure out. Right? Something that is meaningful still, but that no one would really be able to just look at it and figure out in real life. So, any other questions? Yeah. So, uh, I, I can't think of a situation where this would be the case, but that doesn't mean that there's not. So, for example, I hate to cite a movie because that's cliche, but everyone's seen it. So, in war games, they tell the computer to play itself in chess, mm -hmm. and then it learns. So I don't think that 
makes any sense for a Q-learner to fight a Q-learner, but what uh, if a Q-learner fought uh, another machine learning algorithm or simple artificial, artificial intelligence just to train it? So, uh, of I course, the, the point to it is that it learns based on its current state as well. Yeah. And so maybe that doesn't make sense in chess, but... It, it, it still does. It does still make sense in chess. Where it makes sense. Yeah. So AlphaGo, the way they did it, is they did have it play itself. I, I do think what they did though is they would get it to a certain level, and then they would make some sort of improve, or hoped for improvement, and then it have the old version play against the new version. So it's still technically two different algorithms. But it, it would even if you had it playing itself, it would learn, right? Because the data would change. So even if you had two exact versions of itself playing itself, it would it would generate data that it could it would be learning from that would allow it to eventually get better. And you could use a Q learner for chess. The, the fact that they didn't use it for chess was just because it wasn't a strongly well understood theory back then. It would have made sense to have Deep Blue use Q learning for the evaluation algorithm. Well, you may you know you you were going over that and you made an illustration that it would evaluate the current board mm -hmm. and make determinations about what its next move should be. It wasn't evaluating any other boards necessarily. Right? It would evaluate, at, you know, if it was more predictive, it might evaluate five boards in advance. Okay, uh, so, so... Without maintaining... Yeah, so uh, it's, it's two algorithms that you're using together. If I'm getting this right. So it's two algorithms that it's using together. One's the search algorithm, which is an AI algorithm, and one's the evaluation board evaluator which is a machine learning algorithm. Or in the case of AlphaGo, it was a machine learning algorithm. In the case of Deep Blue, it was a hand-made algorithm, so it wasn't AI at all. Okay. Um, when it's doing the board evaluation, it doesn't actually care if it's a current board or a future board. A board evaluation is a board evaluation, yeah. right? So if you have a search algorithm that looks five moves ahead and then evaluates the board versus one that evaluates the current board, the one that looks five moves ahead is obviously going to do better if, if the evaluation algorithm is equivalent in that case. Right? Mm -hmm. Maybe AlphaGo could beat Deep Blue. I mean, one does chess and one does Go, but the AlphaGo, the Deep Blue approach, even though it looks ahead, may lose to the AlphaGo approach, even if it's not looking ahead, because the board evaluation is so much better than what the human can come up with. Right? That was the big key to the success of how they managed to get. Um, uh, alpha go to work to be humans. I'm not sure if my curiosity is coming across. Um, what I mean by the, the state of the board is it, it works, it can work by evaluating just one board at a time. Of course, why don't we evaluate every possible board because that's, that's too vast. Right. So it only makes sense to learn, uh, to, to challenge its learning with other learners if you, if, if it's current transition, if, if, if its model doesn't change with every transition so drastically that it's updating itself. Oh, no, no, yeah, that does make sense. Okay, that was actually the problem that they were facing specifically with Go. So with, think about the state space for chess. Okay, it's so huge that if you tried to do it the way I just described with a table, you would, you would immediately have too many states to evaluate. Okay, so that's why you would not be able to use a Q-learner the way I just implemented it to do chess. It would be a physical impossibility. What you'd actually do is you'd use deep reinforcement learning, which is you can still use Q-learning. You would, you would approximate the state space using a neural net, a, a deep neural net. Um, because neural nets just learn the, the transit, the, the neural net is going to approximate the transition function itself and maybe it needs a million examples to be able to do that to where it's starting to do it accurately. But if it, you just have it play itself, you can get a million examples. You can get a million examples in an afternoon, right? You can get a billion examples in a few weeks or something, right? And you use those examples to train the neural network. So in this case, the Q-learner is attached to the neural network. They're one and the same, right? It's you're implementing the Q-learner, the Q function as a neural network rather than as a table. And because that's what neural nets are good at, is, is approximating the state space like that, even though you're, even though you're only, even if you have 
the AlphaGo play itself billions of times, you're still only actually exploring some itty teeny part of the possible state spaces that exist for Go in particular. Go is huge state space compared to chess. Chess itself is so huge, you can't actually get enough examples of it, right? But the neural network will approximate it anyhow, including an approximation of the state spaces it never sees based on their similarity to ones it does see. Because okay, that's what neural nets do. That's just the nature of neural nets, right? And so that's how they would actually implement it in real life to solve that problem. That's how they did implement it in real life to solve that problem. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. <laughs> what? Why did you feel silly? That's a good well, question. You mentioned neural net networks earlier, and they're the obvious solution to a finite set of table space. They, once trained, they have the ability to substitute for a number of them, and they don't have to maintain them. They probably have to produce them on the way. Right. So. Right, right, right. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, guys.